our 1000th episode is coming out in June. And I know you want to send me a present. You probably want to Venmo me some money or do something, but you don't have to do that. The best present you could give me is to go do a review. We are trying to get a thousand reviews of the podcast by the thousandth episode. If there's an episode that stands out to you, something that's impacted you, and you've never done a review for Practice of the Practice, head on over to your favorite place that you listen to the podcast and do a review. We are trying to get a thousand reviews by our thousandth episode. We'd love for you to go leave us a review for the Practice of the Practice podcast. This is the Practice of the Practice podcast with Joe Sanox, session number 999. I'm Joe Sanok, your host, and welcome to the Practice of the Practice podcast. I hope that your private practice is going amazing. Uh, We often say we like to help you build a thriving practice you absolutely love. We want it to thrive where you know, you're able to make ends meet and financially grow and to uh, just thrive in the way that you want to impact your community. But we also want you to absolutely love it, that you don't have to build things that you don't want to build. You know, if you don't want to be on social media, let's do a different kind of marketing. If you don't want to be focusing on SEO, well, let's work on some things that you really do want to work on. Uh, So we want you to build a thriving private practice you absolutely love. And throughout all of May, uh, we covered our psychedelic assisted therapy series. And we actually have a special guest joining us. I know the last two episodes, we thought we had wrapped up the series, but we could not say no to this amazing guest. So uh, we're going to be jumping right back in um, today uh, before we hit episode 1000. And that comes out tomorrow. Our goal is that by episode 1000 that we have a thousand reviews. Now, the last we checked at the time of this recording, we were about halfway there uh, with about 500 reviews. If you love this show, we know that we get 50,000 to 70,000 or so listens a month. Uh, If just 500 of you would go review us, uh, that would be an amazing gift to us for our 1,000th episode. Uh, We rarely ask you to go review, but in this lead up to our 1,000th episode, um, we've got some really exciting um, people that left us voicemails for that episode, reflections on podcast episodes. It's just going to be an amazing episode that comes out tomorrow. So uh, I am so excited about our guest today. I have Dr. Howard Kornfeld. Howard is a seasoned physician with a career spanning three decades. Uh, He's made a significant contribution in the fields of addiction medicine and pain management. Initially trained in emergency medicine, his interest in psychedelic therapy and activism led him to become a predominant figure in the physician's nuclear disarmament movement. Throughout the 1980s and 90s, Dr. Kornfeld Kornfeld served as a visiting physician in residence at Esalen, where he fostered friendships with influential figures and played a key role in organizing the Pacific Symposium on Psychedelic Drugs. In the late 90s and early 2000s, he spearheaded drug policy reform efforts and became an early adopter uh, in the treatment of opioid addiction and chronic pain. In recent years, he has incorporated ketamine-assisted psychotherapy into his practice and continues to work towards organizing a conference at Esalen in 2025 on the prevention of nuclear war in the context of the ongoing spiritual and psychedelic renaissance. And before we welcome Howard to the show, just a reminder from my attorney that many of the things that we talk about here in this episode are federally illegal in the United States. Please do your own research around these things. Make sure that you consult with your attorney for any risks associated with doing this type of work. Howard, welcome to the Practice of the Practice podcast. Thank you. Wonderful to be here. Mm. Man, just reading your bio, I mean, talk about spanning the history of psychedelic medicine. Uh, I just want to start with, how did you get into this work? Tell us a little bit about kind of that early phase in Esalen. Like, like so where should we start with, with your story? Well, I would go back to the night of the lunar landing, the first lunar landing. And mm. for some reason, I was in college. Um, it was the summertime. It was the late 60s, and um, and I had my first psychedelic experience, coincidentally, with this first lunar landing. And it, uh, it shifted something in my consciousness. And I went on to medical school. I never really figured out what the whole thing was about. But uh, I was then... Uh, 
after medical school, I was working with a Jungian psychotherapist, quite a famous uh, and wonderful one in Chicago. And she said, you need to get out to Esalen and spend time with Stanislav Graf, who is a psychiatrist from Czechoslovakia, who is now in his 90s and is considered one of the leaders of, of psychedelic um, therapy and research and medicine. And uh, so I ended up uh, uh, studying with him at Esalen Institute, which is this fabulous uh, human growth center in on the coast of California. And um, and a lot of things led from there, Joe. Mm. Now, you know, I, I've heard of Esalen over the years uh, as more like a legendary place. Now, what years were you out there? I was there uh, starting in 1977 and ended up um, uh, spending quite a bit of time there. Uh, mostly over the years as what I, as what was called a visiting physician in residence. Um, and so I would periodically, uh, once or twice, uh, uh, a quarter, so to speak, spend a week there. Um, I was sort of the resident doctor when I was there, but in the meantime, I got to know some of the leaders of psychedelic medicine because in the 1980s, that's exactly when MDMA was emerging, and it emerged um, uh, at Esalen more than perhaps any other place, uh, at least on the West Coast. Mm. Now, as that kind of things were emerging there in the 70s and 80s, um, I imagine there was energy around, like, this is going to affect the world, this is going to change the world, and you also witnessed then kind of the government, you know, making things federally illegal. And like, what was that transition like to have kind of so much optimism maybe in the 60s and 70s as to the potential for psychedelic medicine, and then to have that just complete halt in a lot of the research, a lot of just the, the ability to practice above ground, all those sorts of things for that community? Well, you know, in in medicine and pharmacology, there's many different uh, types of medications. There's uh, opiates for pain. There's tranquilizers to calm, you know, anxiety. Uh, there's uh, medications for depression. There's medications for um, kind of manic states. But there was, uh, there has been this big hole that we were not allowed to use anything that was considered a psychedelic or had been placed in Schedule One, which is the uh, the place where you know the the government and the DEA has put these medications that like uh, MDMA, like LSD, like psilocybin, and uh, so there's been a, a big hole, I think, in uh, modern medicine that we've not been able to use those substances. Now, when I met uh, Stan Graf um, uh, at Esalen, it was already um, pretty much the research was already made illegal. And um, so that uh, uh, what, what happened, though, is that that MDMA was not illegal. It was not uh, under the schedule. So there was a flourishing of MDMA use and some preliminary research uh, with MDMA. And the advocates of MDMA, including uh, Sasha Shulgin and Ann Shulgin, the sort of godfather and godmother of, of psychedelic medicine on the West Coast, um, they and their uh, colleagues organized um, a petition to the federal government uh, which was allowed in the procedures. And uh, an administrative law judge, after looking at the preliminary uh, potential of MDMA as a psychotherapeutic uh, uh, medication, the administrative law judge uh, ruled that MDMA should not be put in Schedule One. However, a, a glitch in the federal law allowed the administrator of the DEA to overrule the administrative law judge. So MDMA was 
placed in Schedule 1. And as we speak, the FDA is finally evaluating a very complex uh, set of research studies submitted by essentially the MAPS organization, which is now called LICOS. It's the MAPS Public Benefit Corporation, which is really the, the new pharmaceutical company that is uh, going to uh, be in charge of um, releasing MDMA once FDA approves the drug. Wow. Now, seeing this psychedelic renaissance uh, kind of start to come back over the last 10, 15 years, um, when did you start to see kind of sparks that where, you know, the community maybe saw like, okay, there's there's more coming back. Maybe I've heard people talk about the dark ages of psychedelics or, you know, different metaphors they'll use. When were there indicators for you that something was starting to really come back where there was going to be potential to, to see some of this type of work um, begin sure. again? Well, back in the 90s, I was, um, I was uh, at Esalen, a visiting physician there. I had um, uh, made good connections with, uh, with the community of, of psychedelic researchers, you know, led by uh, Sasha Shulgin and, and Ann Shulgin. And um, I should say that one of the things that inspired me to connect with, um, with the Shulgins was that um, I had already, as you had mentioned, become an activist on the prevention of nuclear war, in addition to being very interested in psychedelics. And what, um, what the Shulgins uh, pointed out was that there seems to be an unusual coincidence between the development of very destructive technologies and the potential development of healing technologies. For example, at the end of 1942, that's when the chain reaction was invented that led to what everyone saw in the film Oppenheimer, the atomic bomb. But only three months later, Albert Hoffman in Switzerland you know, ingested a drug that he had invented a few years back, but hadn't tried. And it was an accidental ingestion at first, and then it was intentional. And that was the discovery of LSD. So there is this link between uh, w what uh, Sasha Shulgin called the Thanatos, the death wish, and then Eros, the life wish, that could be represented by uh, psychedelics, which can enlarge and, and expand the human mind and consciousness. And, and that's why uh, he said, this is why I do what I do. That's why he invented, you know, hundreds of other potentially psychedelic compounds in his life. Now, back to when the ice started to thaw in the 1990s, uh, there was, uh, a couple of researchers, Charlie Grobe at UCLA, Rick Strassman at the University of New Mexico, that finally got some preliminary FDA approval to conduct studies um, with MDMA and, and with uh, DMT um, uh, at the University of New Mexico. And so these studies had started. There was a, a buzz around ibogaine and there was some um, preliminary developments of, of using ibogaine on a Caribbean island, you know, um, and ibogaine had already had a reputation as interrupting opiate addiction in a, in a unique way. So uh, some of my colleagues and I and friends, we put together the Pacific Symposia on Psychedelic Drugs at Esalen, and we had... Um, the, the, the people with preliminary FDA approval to do work. We even had the deputy drug, the former deputy drug czar of, uh, of the White House, uh, who, although he was a conservative and a Republican, he favored psychedelic research. So we brought in some very prestigious people. We brought in uh, a fellow who later became the, the director of the National Institute of Mental Health. So we had, uh, we brought together these folks and at Esalen, it's a very wonderful atmosphere right on the coast. There's some hot, hot springs right on the cliff side. 
and people talk and people kind of make connections which they normally wouldn't make. And out of those conferences came a project run by a fellow named Bob Jesse, who uh, at that time was uh, kind of stepping down from being a very young vice president of Oracle. And then he paired up with some top level uh, drug policy scholars from Harvard. And they said, you know, can we do research on a psychedelic? Could the FDA approve research? It's not necessarily to cure a disease, but is designed to enhance the spiritual quality of an individual. And these scholars said, yes, you can. They, they knew the law. I said, you just have to jump through the hoops. So Bob Jesse and some others um, went to work in uh, 1995, and they identified um, the Hopkins group, a group at Johns Hopkins, uh, led by Roland Griffith, who was a very established professor that, uh, that did work on uh, drugs on human beings. And they identified um, uh, an older gentleman, Bill Richards, who had been involved with LSD work decades earlier. And they created the Hopkins uh, uh, project, which then took 10 years uh, into the, you know, around 2005. But they produced this incredible study that showed that uh, if you gave psilocybin versus giving an active placebo, which in, in that can, instance was Ritalin, which is sort of a stimulant, but under very scientific conditions, they showed that those individuals who were actually not people who were ill, but were normal people who had a religious foundation in their life, they showed that the psilocybin created lasting and, um, you know, and significant um, mystical positive experiences in their life. And that's that sort of started to break the ice. And it took another 10 years until Michael Pollan, you know, really discovered it and, and uh, published his book. And so that I see as the gradual icebreaker, along with the wonderful work that Rick Doblin did with the MAPS organization and with MDMA, which is now um, a book called MDM Bay by uh, Rachel Neuer, among, among other books. But uh, that whole thing is laid out. Um, and, and MDMA, in a way, came out of Esalen to some degree on the West Coast. And the psilocybin study also, in its own way, came out of Esalen. So I was very lucky and fortunate to have just found myself there and have been able to be part of that process. Mm. Imagine the impact you could have with your clients when you are able to practice the most cutting edge modality available today. Psychedelic therapy is the future of mental health care and the Integrative Psychiatry Institute will empower you with the tools and knowledge you need to master this exciting modality. IPI's comprehensive training and in-person experiential practicums will elevate you both personally and professionally. This in-depth curriculum is the gold standard certification in the field. When you join, you will step into a global community of thousands of innovative colleagues who are integrating psychedelic therapy into their practices. Visit psychiatryinstitute.com forward slash apply, where you will find all the information you need about IPI's training. And when you visit psychiatryinstitute.com forward slash apply, you will also receive IPI's free e-report on the current state of psychedelic therapy so you can get the most up-to-date information immediately. Again, that's psychiatryinstitute.com forward slash apply to learn more about the training and get your free report. So now that there's a, a, a new generation of people that are being introduced to a lot of this, um, you know, having been with so many influential figures you know, throughout the 70s, 80s, 90s that were you know, affecting policy, affecting research, affecting you know, the next kind of phase of psychedelic medicine, like what would you hope 
kind of this this next generation of of therapists, psychologists, counselors, people that listen to this podcast, like what what kind of wisdom or um, activism would you impart on them? Well, I am um, convinced that the way uh, forward for humanity, you know, is to open itself up to these psychedelic medicines. They're not panaceas. They need to be cultivated carefully within the medical system, number one. But we all know that they can't be confined to the medical system because, in a sense, they belong to humanity. You know, that these substances were part, most likely, of the emergence of religion in multiple areas of the world. So a great amount of care needs to be exercised in introducing these these medicines. At the same time, the world is in the most precarious place one could imagine with nuclear ICBM missiles, you know, on alert, uh, with the president of the United States having so-called 20 minutes of warning before making a decision essentially to destroy the entire planet. Mm -hmm. Um, At the same time, as as we all know, climate change continues, global warming continues. So my sense is that there's a link between this emergence right now in in the 2020s and the fact that so much has been neglected uh, in our consciousness in terms of creating a safer world. So I believe there's some kind of resonance between this, and I plan to dedicate my remaining years to to understanding this. Now, of course, we also have an epidemic of addiction in the world. I've been involved with the opiate system, and I've been involved with introducing a wonderful drug called buprenorphine, you know, that was discovered and is so underutilized still to combat opiate addiction. But as we know, we have an epidemic of alcoholism. Uh, There are new drugs that will emerge. Even ketamine, which has so much healing potential, has now sort of escaped Pandora's box. And in particularly in California, there's an epidemic now of ketamine addiction, which is a warning to the psychedelic um, uh, consciousness movement that we have to be very, very careful with these substances, that although they're not, most of them, intrinsically addictive, that some some of them, like ketamine, can have an addictive quality for those who are very vulnerable and those who might be taken advantage of by commercial interests that are not... Um, uh, uh, don't have the the uh, the ethics that are needed to really shepherd this these psychedelic technologies um, into our community. Mm. Now, I want to talk a little bit about your advocacy work in regards to nuclear weapons because I know that that's been kind of a practical outcome and action you know from some of your psychedelic work. Probably other things as well have influenced that. How did that become a forefront? Uh, kind of topic or area that that you wanted to have activism in? Well, it, it really goes back to the Three Mile Island nuclear accident, which many of your listeners probably are too young to know about. But in 1979, a nuclear power plant um, had a partial meltdown in Pennsylvania, spreading radiation. And the uh, someone named Ralph Nader, who is responsible for all of us having seatbelts. I knew that this guy was right because I was an emergency doctor and I saw uh, the benefits of seatbelts. And then he said, let's evacuate 50 miles around this plant. The governor said, no, we're only evacuating five miles, pregnant women and children. So I knew something was wrong. And one thing led to another. And I discovered not only the dangers of nuclear energy technology, but then 
there was a, a buildup in the early 1980s of nuclear weapons, and there was a philosophy to fight nuclear war when President Ronald Reagan came in. And so physicians got together, a lot of other citizens got together, and basically we helped change the consciousness even of, of the very conservative President Reagan, who then became committed to nuclear disarmament. Uh, fast forward decades later, we're, we're in a similar position where for some reason, the leaders of both of our political parties, both the right and the left, uh, neither of them have woken up to the fact that the nuclear arms race has now become uh, much more dangerous. Uh, some of, Many of the treaties are, are being uh, 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 ignored or being abrogated. And uh, this is the time, again, that we need a, a global consciousness movement. And in fact, there is one, but we don't really know about it much in the United States. There is a, a treaty, a United Nations treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. And this treaty has been ratified by 67, 68 countries, including a number of European countries, Ireland, uh, Austria, uh, uh, New Zealand. Uh, several countries in Europe are, are sending uh, delegations. Uh, neither, the, neither the right or the left in the United States uh, political parties, the Democrats, Republicans, uh, even mention uh, this treaty. Uh, so uh, I, I don't think it's coincidental that psychedelics are emerging. The Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons is emerging. And we just need to get people talking to each other, I think, to catalyze like a new movement towards um, not only global consciousness, but global peace and security. Mm. Now, if people are listening right now and they're thinking, I, I want to do more, whether it's in regards to learning more about psychedelic medicine or learning more about like nuclear issues or politics. And you know, what are some directions for that you would suggest that they can start to just think through kind of what they want to work on, what they want to take action on, what they should be learning, how they should be learning? Like, what are some resources maybe to get people started that maybe this is the first time they've heard of any of this? Um, or maybe they, you know, have listened to this whole series and, and they're thinking, this this is interesting. I want to dip my toes in a little bit more. What would you suggest would be some starting points for people? Okay. Um, well, uh, there, for example, as we speak, uh, a famous actress, Kristen Stewart, is working um, to raise money for a documentary that would honor the life of Daniel Ellsberg, which uh, he was a whistleblower, not only in the Pentagon Papers, but in in discussing the high risk of nuclear war. So uh, she needs help. Kristen Stewart needs help. And um, uh, I could link any of your listeners to her. Uh, maybe I'll mention our website, uh, recoverywithoutwalls.com. And feel free to reach out to us for, for any, um, any questions on psychedelics or addiction, but also on how to plug into the nuclear issue. I think uh, uh, the Kristen Stewart project is very, very appealing. I'm part of the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. Uh, that's called IPPNW. It's easy to find. Um, and there's another website called uh, Back from the Brink um, that is uh, physicians in the United States are working to move us back from the, the brink of, uh, of accidental nuclear war. So there's many, many ways to go about it. There, there, um, there was a New York Times series on the new um, uh, risks of nuclear war would be very easy to find and read. There was a whole issue of Scientific American, December of 2023, called The New Nuclear Age. Extremely helpful reading for, for anyone who wants to learn what's happening now. Mm, so helpful. 
You know, the last question I always ask is if every private practitioner in the world were listening right now, what would you want them to know? Well, I'd want them to know that their, um, the challenges that they face um, uh, are uh, complex, but by integrating, um, let's say, ecology, by integrating psychedelic consciousness, I think that's the way forward. I don't think it's an easy path, but I think it will be the most rewarding path for practitioners. And every practitioner is faced with a load of, of clients and patients who are experiencing the anxiety of this age we live in, but are also anticipating healing. And so it's a it's it's both a, a difficult but wonderful period, I think, to be a healer and to be a practitioner. And I really appreciate, you know, your podcast to try to get this uh, inspiration out. Mm. So awesome. Howard, if people want to connect with you, they want to connect with your work, where should we send them? Well, I think that website, recoverywithoutwalls.com, we, we came up with that name because many people in addiction recovery, they didn't fit into the rehabs or they didn't fit into this particular, the 12 step or not the 12 step. Or, so we called it Recovery Without Walls, and recoverywithoutwalls.com is our medical practice in uh, Mill Valley, California, and we'd be happy to uh, to speak with anyone and guide them in their path around recovery from addiction, recovery from depression, recovery from uh, ecological anxiety, uh, and, and to give them uh, tools and steps forward. Mm. So awesome. Well, thank you, Howard, so much for being on the Practice of the Practice podcast. Yeah, it's been a pleasure, Joe. You know, it's interesting to think through just the chain of people and movements and, you know, whether it's, you know, like in the series when we were talking about ayahuasca for how long ayahuasca has been used in Peru and in Central and South America and to think of this chain of people that, you know, it takes to have these traditions be living traditions. And you know, sometimes it can feel when when you're you know, entering the professional space or you're prof entering kind of your professional world, that it's like, you know, I'm, I'm too young, I'm too new, I'm too inexperienced, I'm just learning this stuff to, to jump in. But, you know, Howard was, you know, at that point too, when he was just kind of getting out of college. And, you know, he happened to be around some people that were going to do some really influential work, and himself included. And, and we never know what the communities that we surround ourselves with, like what that's going to turn into, um, you know, what impact we're going to have in, in the work you know, we're doing. Uh, you know, even just thinking about, you know, 999 episodes ago, uh, pulling out a microphone, standing in my attic, having a blanket over my head for better sound to start a podcast. Uh, like, who knew that that would you know, be now a thousand episodes in? So I want to just encourage you to just see what's coming up for you. You know, there may be kind of little sparks inside of you, little embers that you're like, I'm, I just want to explore that more. You know, that doesn't mean that you have to go down that path and, you know, attach to that path or have that be the path. You don't have to know all that. But you can say, I find that interesting right now. You know, this is one thing that Howard said really, you know, is resonating with, with me. Um, you know, maybe even a week from now, you're still thinking about it honor that like dig into that step into that and you know take some steps towards where you're being inspired and just explore have, have some creative meandering um, to see if there's something there i know for myself as i've gone through this series like it's it's created a, a bit of an ember in me in regards to being interested in some therapeutic work again you know i sold my practice back in 2019 and um, just starting to think about you know is some of this work we've discussed something i want more training in and what does that look like and you know, i've been having some conversations with people i trust around that uh, and so see what's coming up for you um, start you know taking those steps into into new things um, to, to explore it 
If you're like me, you like to gather a lot of information before you make a new decision like adding a new modality to your practice. That's why I'm so excited that our sponsor for this series, the Psychiatry Institute, has put together an amazing e-report called The Current State of Psychedelic Therapy. You can get that totally for free over at psychiatryinstitute.com forward slash apply. That's where you can get that free report, The Current State of Psychedelic Therapy, again over at psychiatryinstitute.com forward slash apply. Thank you so much for letting me into your ears and into your brain. Have a great day. I'll talk to you soon. Special thanks to the band Silence is Sexy for that intro music, and this podcast is designed to provide accurate and authoritative information in regard to the subject matter covered. It is given with the understanding that neither the host, the producers, the publishers, or guests are rendering legal, accounting, clinical, or other professional information. If you want a professional, you should find one.